So I'm going to talk about my views on professor and product development and the way I see product development should be. It's moving toward it, but it's not there yet. And I call it discipline free. That is a term that I made up by myself. Okay, I'm going to start with the task. So here's your task. You need to create concepts for a device that's used in a manufacturing process. You have five balls in a box, and you need to move those to another box, maybe from the manufacturing line to packaging, who knows what it is. Um, you cannot damage the balls or the boxes. Um, you have to be at least six inches away from the balls and the boxes. Um, your device needs to be used repeatedly, and um, it's be low cost and easy to manufacture. Just quickly in your head, come up with at least one idea, but maybe three. Everybody thinking moving balls over? Okay. Anybody brave enough to share what they came up with? Okay, I, I knew this, so I'm prepared. These are the results from the first time ever that I run this study. Okay, the most common idea was some sort of a slide or ramp to pour the balls into the other box. The second one was that you might recognize from like an um, arcade, a grabber kind of thing that grabs the balls and goes like this. And then there's other ideas, okay? Then um, after a while, we repeated the study with a lot of other people. And after 121 subjects, these are the most common ideas. So the arcade grabber, most common by far, then the ramp, vacuum, scoop, conveyor, and so on. Okay, hand up anybody who has an idea that's not on the list. Okay, zero hands, that could be shyness, so let me ask the reverse. Whose ideas are exactly on the list? Okay, that's essentially all of you. Okay, I knew that. Okay, I've done that before. So that's a problem. I'm gonna return back to this in a minute. Why that's a problem, I wanted to see the problem first. First, product development, people often ask, what is it? Um, when I go to the US, they ask me, Professor Product Development, what is it, w what product? It's a bizarre question, so what does it really mean? Um, so, first of all, it has roots in mechanical engineering, and my talk is kind of based on that, because that's a little silly, but that's where it comes from, also very common in, uh, in business schools. Um, but it's essentially a process of designing, creating some sort of a solution, usually a product or a service, to solve a problem. Uh, hopefully benefits a customer somehow and makes profit for the company making it, right? Research in this field is making this better. You can define what the better is. Is it faster, more efficient, more cost effective, more innovative? You define what better is. But that's what the research is about. And typically product development is divided into some sort of a phase. There's many, many models. It's not really linear. But you start somehow looking at, okay, what is really needed out there? Come up with whole lot of ideas for it. Do a high level of concept design of it. Then system level design, move on to detail design, finally testing, integrating it all together, and then product launch. That is product development. The title of my talk, however, was a dis Towards Discipline-Free Product Development. So let me talk about discipline or disciplinarity for a while. So in all the university, the term multidisciplinary is used a lot. And we actually have to stop that. Um, <laughs> because um, those of you who have children may know what parallel play means. So children are playing side by side, but separate games. Not, not really together. They're not arguing in any way, but they're independently playing parallel. That's what multidisciplinary means, okay? It's better than unidisciplinary, but it's not working together, okay? So what we really need to talk about is interdisciplinary, because that's when you start working together, solving problems together, the way that your solution is somehow codependent on the expertise from all these different disciplines. Much better playing together, okay? Um, in research, there's another term that's getting more and more popular, it's called transdisciplinary. This is great, actually, but it's usually not applied in education side, mostly in research. Um, easy example of this is bioengineering. So you have biologists, you have engineers, both go beyond the disciplinary boundary, bioengineering happens. And now we're actually training bioengineers, which is now discipline. So now they have to work outside their discipline to go transdisciplinary again. So discipline-free is something that turns this, the whole idea of discipline um, upside down. So what you want to do is go a problem first, because nobody cares out there. You know, all the products that you have, you don't buy them because a mechanical engineer developed them or because a bioengineer developed them. You buy them because it solves the problem. 
problem first, right? Who cares what the discipline is? And this radically changes how we research and teach product development, okay? So here's some issues. First of all, yeah, so unidisciplinary is not very good. I'm a mechanical engineer, so there's a mechanical product. That's awesome, okay? We all know that most products are really somewhat joined between different disciplines, electromechanical, for example. Then we run into the second issue, integration. You know that if you have a complex project, they actually plan that when in the integration phase, when everything's decided, all you have to do is put it together, they plan 100% cost overrun. That's just the planned overrun. Then there's an unplanned overrun that happens after, okay? Integration issues, really bad. So parallel play, trying to work together, not really working. And then just a funny story from a um, um, long time ago when this university was called TKK, but a project between TKK and MIT, they were developing a Christmas tree stand. Um, this is not it, but it looked like that. So you see the shape, right? Um, when you are taught particular skills in your discipline, you will apply those skills no matter what the problem is. In this case, it was very funny. People at MIT, they need to make this thing. They are mechanical engineers. They are really good in machining. They buy a solid block of steel, stick it on a uh, milling machine, and break the device. That uh, was awesome. Okay? <laughs> and that's just a funny example that I mentioned, but similar things happen all the time. I know to do it this way, so I'm going to do it this way, even though the problem might require a different solution. So discipline is not very good. Stepping back a little bit of support from research, this is research from a um, couple of years ago. We studied a little over 300 products that were categorized as innovative by third party folk, and we compared those, what is innovative, to everything else out there at the exact same time in the market. Um, turns out that the innovative products exhibit th um, three out of 13 characteristics of innovation that we had defined. We don't have time to get into the details of that, but the important part is to notice that the characteristics happen to be in three categories. So in this case, the purple categories matter. So external interactions, how the product somehow interacts with where it goes to, whether it's material, information, energy, or the infrastructure. So how does it fit into the context? Um, architecture, as well as user interactions. The two categories where almost um, no innovations were found were function and cost, okay? If we tie this back to disciplines, pick engineering first, mechanical, electrical, very common in product development. Okay, we are really taught how to make something work, how to improve its functionality. That's great for incremental product development and absolutely necessary. Yes, we have to make them work. Are you going to create innovations that way? Eh, very rarely. Actually, the number is uh, 9%, so I actually know the number for that. Um, we are taught a little bit of part architecture, so the architecture part comes into play a little bit. And we get a little bit of basic science training, so we're able to do the other part. If we start working with business and natural sciences, we get a little bit better. Business school does marketing. They help us with you know, design to cost, target costing, all kinds of business aspects of it. And then um, understanding some of the external interactions, in particular the, the energy flows and such, come from natural sciences. But what really starts helping when you start going to arts and social sciences, because they understand all kinds of abstract, fluffy things that when a scientist is a scientist, they don't value. But when they turn into a consumer and go and buy a product, they care a whole lot about, like, can I use my product, for example. So social sciences, they actually study the human. It's not considered noise. It's part of what they study and they understand. So working with them, highly useful. So collaborations outside the discipline really needed. You cannot do product development within a single discipline. What is kind of mostly what it's done today, or sometimes multidisciplinary. Okay, some success stories. So I've been lucky enough the past three years, I was able to uh, be in a university that was started, and we started teaching product development university-wide without defining any disciplines. We had a team of teachers from all kinds of disciplines. Some have an arts background, some have a science background, some have diff different degrees in engineering, all just teaching how to design a better world, actually, that was the motto, how to design a better world. So what happens? Turns out students just eat it up. They, they have no idea, they couldn't care less about disciplines, and they do it really well. The challenges are with the instructors, but let me show what the students did. So they, uh, this is just one particular example, there's 60 of these, but he, the, here's one. So how to store fresh food, food without cool air, so fridge with no cool air, okay? That's tricky. If you want one particular discipline, and all of you have a discipline, so you're probably thinking through your discipline right now how to do this. It's a short lecture, so I'll jump directly into 
what the students start doing. Okay, problem first. What do you need to know? What's fresh? What does it mean? What is fresh? Uh, why and how does food decay? What are the different mechanisms? Why does that happen? And how do we prevent that or slow it down? What's out there already? Where is this device used? By whom and why? Right? And what is actually stored in it? All these things value are valuable, and you probably understand now that I said it to you. If I, you'd done the task, you were probably not thinking of all of these things. Okay, students did. They were awesome. Some of them looked into the science of uh, food decay and uh, methods there. Somebody went into a whole lot of households and looked at, okay, what do people actually store? So real pictures from real people's uh, refrigerators. Ideation, of course, important part of product development. Also, the classroom smelled really funky for a year because people were testing food and how they decay and how to slow that down. Um, that was fun. And of course, there's a serious engineering there too. People are creating, um, it was to be a circuit for a vacuum pump, the physical prototype of the same. Then we also have system engineers that are applying their um, life cycle analysis skills because the whole idea behind this was that you can create a fridge that consumes essentially no energy because you don't use cool air. So if you are in the engineering, you realize that in general, cooling and heating is very energy consuming um, operation, so you want to try to do that without it. So analyzing that and also making sure the new, new product indeed saved energy. So long story short, this is what came out of it. It's a fresh box. Kind of looks like those Fiskars things that they have there, except that it has a functional unit on the bottom that keeps food fresh. Okay. Um, I can tell you later, but this is being taped, so I'm not going to get into the, the details of exactly um, how this thing works. But it uses two particular methods, neither one of which is cool air, and it preserves food. Okay, Very, very cool thing, and that's the student team and myself at the uh, final show of that thing. Very cool stuff happens. Lots of other success stories I'd be happy to share, but we out of time, so I'll just, instead I'll share sort of the learnings. So my personal things, when you start teaching product development out with people outside your discipline, what improves about it compared to just doing it within your discipline? And when I say my discipline, it's still kind of within engineering, even with other engineers, right? So first of all, I am a mechanical engineer. So what's good about our discipline? Well, product development comes from there. And we have a long history of studying product development. So what works, what doesn't work? Um, I just ask you to do ideation. And most of you had the ideas that were on the board. I can teach you ideation methods that I know work, um, and you would have come up with other ideas than what were on the board. Okay, So we have experience in making methods better and proving which ones work and don't work, why and how and when. Okay, In industrial design, huge experience in understanding the user, much beyond basic surveys and interviews, all these common methods that don't really work. Um, architecture is amazing. You know what they start all projects with? It's site analysis. They go to the site where the new building is going to be built, and they look at what does this need to fit into? Who's already here? What's already there? You know that mechanical engineers don't do that? And like, as an afterthought, it seems silly, but something that we can learn from architects. Human-computer action, I love that field a lot. It's still engineering, of course. But I love how they question the status quo. It's not enough to improve something a little bit, but just completely do something differently. Really fun to watch. But they do it kind of ad hoc compared to knowing that you could do something more systematically and with proven methods. Psychology, of course, understanding the human. Humans, not noise. They understand that you can build on that, whether it's the designer who's designing the product or the user you're designing for. Material science, really cool stuff happening in here. So, um, for example, right now, the way we do, we do design for manufacturing, and you know, we select materials based on you know, what fits our current need. With material scientists, we can do the other way. I can tell them, I need to see through a material that conducts electricity the other way, but then insulated the other way. And they can do that. That's awesomeness. Um, here's a research example. Back to psychology again. Um, psychologists have a theory called fixation. I don't have time to get into that a lot, but you all exhibited fixation by listing the examples I already showed on the board for you. Right? When you understand that phenomena, you can attack it, battle and It's a barrier to creativity. Understanding that theory helps you make better, me better methods. And then, of course, the psychologists benefit as well, because they get real engineering problems. And the big difference there is that um, engineering problems are constraint. So there's always a, a schedule, feasibility, time, material. There's some sort of a constraint in the problem, which is different from traditional problem solving in psychology. So they also benefit from it. But the role of discipline is not understood. So if I'll show you just a very simple example, just a P diagram from a particular study done uh, maybe a year ago. 
just a creativity study trying to measure if something affects the level of creativity. In this case, it was uh, looking at an over-constrained problem versus open problem statement. That doesn't matter for this story. What was interesting is that this study had been repeated multiple times, and they always control for design problem, the time, the method, all the things to have a proper experiment, but they'd also always control the discipline, kind of by accident, because if you do it in a class, you have all mechanical engineers, for example. You do it in a different class, they're always the same. Now this one time, they run it with a completely mixed batch of people with all kinds of disciplines, again, covered sciences, engineering, arts, all kinds of folk. And the results were completely messy. Previously, there was a very clear trend in statistical difference, and there was very clear you know, results. With this, complete mess. Of course, the postdoc doing the study was just devastated because it's very hard to publish academically such results. But I see amazing power there. Okay, there's something there. When you come from a different discipline, you answer a problem, or your level of creativity is completely different. That affects more than what you were studying earlier. So there's something amazing going on there that we need to study that more. Okay? With that, I want to remind you of the task again. So you were all shy, so I'm not going to bother you too much more about it, but how many of you started thinking, okay, why are they even moved? What are they made out of? Why are we doing this? Who's doing it? What is the machine? Does the machine do something else? What's already out there? All these other things that affect it help you think differently and then maybe solve the problem a whole lot better than what we you know, did just now, okay? That concludes my talk, and I will open to any questions if we have time for that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>